Time for book club. Let's say the prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day. We're thankful for thy many blessings, and we're thankful for the the hard things that make us stronger, and the things in our life that bring us joy. We pray that we can hold tight to those and. We are thankful for our team and the amazing camaraderie we feel. We pray that we can always share the good and the hard so that we can know that we understand each other. We're thankful for the gospel in our lives and for Christ and that he knows all that we go through. We pray that we can be positive and happy and that thou will guide us to know how to reach out to those who need us in love and in patience. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. <laughs> How are you? Tired. <laughs> I feel ya. I feel ya. Forced myself to get up to get ready this morning because I was like, I don't want to do it today. So I just did it. <laughs> there you go. All right. You missed the prayer. So we're just going to start reading. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. We're on. So I actually got the book. Yeah. Yay. So it's actually, I couldn't see what page it was on the Kindle, but it was like pre pages, <clears throat> which is 19XIX. That's 19, right? I think it's 19. I don't know. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. So on numer on innumerable occasions, spouses attending the banquet given at the end of the course have told me that their homes have been much happier since their husbands or wives started this training. People are frequently astonished at the new results they achieve. It all seems like magic. In some cases, in their enthusiasm, they have telephoned me at my home on Sundays because they couldn't wait 48 hours to report their achievements at the regular session of the course. One man was so stirred by a talk on these principles that he sat far into the night discussing them with other members of the class. At 3 o'clock in the morning, the others went home. He was so shaken by a realization of his own mistakes, so inspired by the vista of a new and richer world opening before him, <clears throat> that he was unable to sleep. He didn't sleep that night or the next or the next day or the next night. Who was he? A naive, untrained individual ready to gush over any new theory that came along. No, far from it. He was a sophisticated blase dealer in art, very much the man about town who spoke three languages fluently and was a graduate of two European universities. While writing this chapter, I received a letter from a German of the old school, an, aristoc an aristocrat whose forebears had served for generations as professional army officers under the Hohenzollerns. I guess. His letter, written from a trans transatlantic steamer telling about the application of these principles, rose almost to a religious fervor. Another man, an old New Yorker, a Harvard graduate, a wealthy man, <clears throat> the owner of a large carpet factory, declared he had learned more in 14 weeks through this system of training about the fine art of influencing people than he had learned about the same subject during his four years in college. Absurd? Laughable? Fantastic? Of course, you are pri privileged to dismiss this statement with whatever adjective you wish. <clears throat> Sorry, I got so much throat. <clears> throat> I am merely reporting without comment a declaration made by a conservative and eminently successful Harvard graduate in a public address to approximately 600 people at the Yale Club in New York on the evening of Thursday, February 23, 1933. Compared to what we ought to be, said the famous professor William James of Harvard, compared to what we ought to be, we are only half awake. We are making use of only a small part of our physical and mental resources. Stating the thing broadly, the human individual thus lives far within his limits. He possesses powers of various sorts which he habitually fails to use. <clears throat> it's almost out. I can feel it. <laughs> Those powers which you habitually fail to use, 
The sole purpose of this book is to help you discover, develop, and profit by those dormant and unused assets. Education, says John um, G. Hibben, former president of Princeton University, is the ability to meet life situations. If by the time you have finished reading the first three chapters of this book, if you aren't then a little better equipped to meet life situations, then I shall consider this book to be a total failure so far as you are concerned. For the great aim of education, said Herbert Spencer, is not knowledge, but action. And this is an action book. Mm. Okay. Still in the pre-book, it says nine suggestions to get the most out of this book. Number one. If you wish to get the most out of this book, there is one indispensable requirement, one essential infinitely more important than any rule or technique. Unless you have this one fundamental requisite, a thousand rules on how to study will avail little. And if you do have this cardinal endowment, then you can achieve wonders without reading any suggestions for getting the most out of a book. What is this magic requirement? Just this, a deep driving desire to learn a vigorous, or sorry, a deep driving desire to learn, a vigorous determination to increase your ability to deal with people. <clears throat> how can you develop such an urge? By constantly reminding yourself how important these principles are to you. Picture to yourself how their mastery will aid you in leading a richer, fuller, happier, and more fulfilling life. Say to yourself over and over, my popularity, my happiness, and sense of worth depend to no small extent upon my skill in dealing with people. Number two, read each chapter rapidly at first to get a bird's eye view of it. You will probably be tempted then to rush on to the next one, but don't, unless you are reading merely for entertainment. But if you are reading because you want to increase your skill in human relations, then go back and reread each chapter thoroughly. In the long run, this will mean saving time and getting results. 3. Stop frequently in your reading to think over what you are reading. Ask yourself just how and when you can apply each suggestion. Read number 4. Read with a crayon, pencil, pen, magic marker, or highlighter in your hand. When you come across a suggestion that you feel you can use, draw a line beside it. If it is a four-star suggestion, then underscore every sentence or highlight it, or mark it with stars. There's four stars. Uh, marking and underscoring a book makes it more interesting and far easier to review rapidly. <clears throat> Number five, I knew a woman who had been office manager for a large insurance concern for 15 years. Every month she read all the insurance contracts her company had issued that month. Yes, she read many of the same contracts over month after month. Oh, she read them over month after month, year after year. Why? because its experience had taught her that that was the only way she could keep their provisions clearly in mind. I once spent almost two years writing a book on public speaking, and yet I found I had to keep going back over it from time to time in order to remember what I had written in my own book. The rapidity with which we forget is astonishing. So, if you want to get a real lasting benefit out of this book, don't imagine that skimming through it once will suffice. <clears throat> After reading it thoroughly, you ought to spend a few hours reviewing it every month. Keep it on your desk in front of you every day. Glance through it often. Keep constantly impressing yourself with the rich possibilities for improvement that still lie in the offing. I don't know what that means. Okay, remember that the use of these principles can be made habitual only by a constant and vigorous campaign of review and application. There is no other way. Bernard Shaw, oh, this is number six. Bernard Shaw once remarked, if you teach a man anything, he will never learn. Shaw was right. Learning is an active process. We learn by doing. So if you desire to master the principles you are studi studying in this book, do something about them. Apply these rules at every opportunity. If you don't, you will forget them quickly. Only knowledge that is used sticks in your mind. You will probably find it difficult to apply these suggestions all the time. I know because I wrote the book. And yet, frequently, I found it difficult to apply everything I advocated. For example, when you are displeased, it is much easier to criticize and condemn than it is to try to understand the other person's viewpoint. It is frequently easier to find fault than to find praise. It is more natural to talk about what you want than to talk about what the other person wants, and so on. 
So as you read this book, remember that you are not merely trying to acquire information. You are attempting to form new habits. Ah uh, yes, you are attempting a new way of life. That will require time and persistence and daily application. So refer to these pages often. Regard this as a working handbook on human relations. And whenever you are confronted with some specific problem, such as handling a child, winning your spouse to your way of thinking, or satisfying an irritated customer, hesitate about doing the natural thing, the impulsive thing. This is usually wrong. Instead, turn to these pages and review the paragraphs you have underscored. Then try these new ways and watch them achieve magic for you. Number seven, offer your spouse, your child, or some business associate a dime or a dollar every time he or she catches you violating a certain principle. Make a lively game out of mastering these rules. <laughs> That's funny. I don't want to do that one. <laughs> Number eight. The president of an important Wall Street bank once described in a talk before one of my classes a highly efficient system he used for self-improvement. This man had little formal schooling, yet he had become one of the most important financiers in America, and he confessed that he owed most of his success to the constant application of his homemade system. This is what he does. I'll put it in his own words as accurately as I can remember it. For years, I have kept an engagement book showing all the appointments I had during the day. My family never made any plans for me on Saturday night, but the family knew that I devoted a part of each Saturday evening to the illuminating process of self-examination and appraisal. After dinner, I went off by myself, opened my engagement book, and thought over all the interviews, discussions, and meetings that had taken place during the week. And we'll stop. There's just one and a half more pages left of this. And then it's the real book. <laughs> but I like the intro. It's good. Ooh, okay. Thanks. Bye.